We are on page 34, starting with Joseph again. And if you need a reminder of what's going on with him, go ahead and check page 24. This is Joseph on a train to Hamburg, Germany, 1939, one day from home. The Hitler youth led Joseph down the narrow corridor of the German passenger car. Tears sprang to Joseph's eyes. The brown shirt who'd taken his father away on Kristallnacht had said, we'll come for you soon enough. But Joseph hadn't waited. He'd gone to them with this stupid stunt. They came to a compartment with a man in the uniform of the Gestapo, the Nazi secret state police, and Joseph stumbled. The Gestapo man looked up at them through the window in his door. No, not here, not now, not like this, Joseph prayed. And the Hitler youth boy pushed Joseph on path. They came to the door of the Jewish train car, and the Hitler youth spun Joseph around. He glanced over his shoulder to make sure no one was listening. What were you thinking? The boy whispered. Joseph couldn't speak. The boy thrust the armband at Joseph's chest. Put that on, and don't ever do that again, the Hitler youth told Joseph. Do you understand? I, yes, Joseph stammered. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. The Hitler youth breathed hard, his face red, like he was the one in trouble. So, let's take a look at this. Why do we think this boy didn't turn Joseph in? See what we think. He spotted the piece of candy Joseph had bought for Ruth and took it. He stood taller, tugged at the bottom of his brown shirt to straighten it, then turned and marched away. Joseph slipped back into his compartment, still shaking and collapsed onto his bench. He stayed there the rest of the trip, his armband securely in place and as visible as possible. He didn't even leave to go to the bathroom. Hours later, the train pulled into Hamburg Central Railway Station. Joseph's mother led him and his sister through the crowds to the Hamburg docks, where their ship waited for them. Joseph had never seen anything so big. If you stood the ship on end, it would have been taller than any building in Berlin. Two giant tan smokestacks stuck up in the middle of the ship, one of them belching gray-black diesel engine smoke. A steep ramp ran to the top of the tall black hull, and hundreds of people were already on board, milling around under colorful, fluttering pennants and waving to friends and family down on the docks, flying highest above them all, as if to remind everyone, who was in charge was the red and white Nazi flag with the black swastika in the middle. So take another look at this, and then I want you to answer this question. Why is there a Nazi flag on a Jewish boat? The ship was called the MS St. Louis. St. Louis was the name of a city in America, Joseph had learned. That seemed like a good omen to him, a sign that they would eventually get to America. Maybe one day visit the real St. Louis. A shabby-looking man stumbled out from behind the crates and luggage piled up on the dock, and Ruthie screamed. Joseph jumped, and his mother took a frightened step back. The man reached out for them. You made it, at last. That voice, Joseph thought. Could it really be? The man threw his arms around Mama. She let him hug her, even though she still held her hands across her chest, as if to ward him off. He stepped back and held her at arm's length. My dearest Rachel, he said, I thought I'd never see you again. It was. It was him, the shabby man who had lurched from the shadows like an escapee from a mental asylum, was Joseph's father, Aaron Landau. Joseph shuddered. His papa looked nothing like the man who had been dragged away from their home six months ago. His thick brown hair and beard had been shaved off, and his head and face were covered with scraggly stubble. He was thinner, too, too thin, a skeleton in a threadbare suit, three sizes too big for him. Okay. Let's take a look here. So they see Joseph is seeing his dad again for the first time in six months, and here are some descriptions of him. He looks like an escapee from a mental asylum, right? So someone who escaped from a mental hospital. Uh, he is really thin. 
He's lost a lot of weight. He shaved his beard off. So this is what's happening when Joseph sees his father again. So then I want you to make a personal connection here. How would you feel if this is how you were reunited with a family member after six months? And why would you feel that way? Aaron Landau's eyes bulged from his gaunt face as he turned to look at his children. Joseph's breath caught in his throat, and Ruthie cried out and buried her face in Joseph's stomach as their papa pulled the two of them into a hug. He smelled so ripe, like the alley behind a butcher shop, that Joseph had to turn his head away. Joseph, Ruth, my darlings. He kissed the top of their heads again and again, then jumped back. He looked around manically, like there were spies everywhere. We have to go. We can't stay here. We have to get on board before they stop us. But I have tickets, Mama said. Visas. Papa shook his head too quickly. It doesn't matter, he said. His eyes looked they were going to pop out of their sockets. They'll stop us. Take me back. Ruthie clung to her brother. Papa was scaring her. He scared Joseph, too. Hurry, Papa said. He pulled the family with him into the stacks of crates, and Joseph tried to keep up with him as he darted from place to place, dodging imaginary enemies. Joseph gave his mother a frightened glance that said, What's wrong with Papa? Mama just shook her head, her eyes full of worry. So thinking about why he's acting this way, why do you think Papa is so paranoid? Based on his experience, where was he for the past six months that can help you figure that out? When they got close to the ramp, Papa hunkered down behind the last of the crates. On the count of three, we make a break for it, he told his family. Don't stop. Don't stop for anything. We have to get on that ship. Are you ready? One, two, three. Joseph wasn't ready. None of them were. They watched as Aaron Landau ran for the ramp, where other passengers had already queued up to hand their tickets to a smiling man in a sailor's uniform. Joseph's father threw himself past the sailor and stumbled into the ramp's railing before righting himself and sprinting up the gangway. Wait, the sailor cried. Quickly now, children, Mama said. Together they hurried to the ramp as best they could, carrying all the suitcases. I have his ticket, she told the sailor. I'm sorry, we can wait our turn. The startled man at the front of the line motioned for them to go ahead, and Joseph's mother thanked him. My husband is just eager to leave, she told the sailor. He smiled sadly and punched their tickets. I understand. Oh, let me get someone to help you with those bags. Porter? Joseph stood in wonder as another sailor, a German man without a star of David armband, a man who wasn't a Jew, put a suitcase under each arm and one in each hand and led them up the gangway. He treated them like real passengers, like real people. And he wasn't the only one. Every sailor they met doffed his cap at them, and the steward who showed them to their cabin assured them that they could call upon him for anything they needed while on board anything at all. Their room was spotless. The bed linens were freshly laundered and the hand towels were pressed and neatly stacked. It's a trick, Papa said when the door was closed. He glanced around the little cabin like the walls were closing in. They'll come for us soon enough, he said. Why does this line keep repeating? Why is it important? Why is Alan Gratz putting it there? It was just what the brown shirt had told Joseph. Mama put her hands on Joseph's and Ruthie's heads. Why don't you two go on up to the promenade, she said softly. I'll stay here with your father. Joseph and Ruth were only too glad to get away from Papa. A few hours later, they watched from the promenade as tugboats pushed this MS St. Louis away from the dock and passengers threw a confetti and celebrated and blew tearful kisses goodbye. Joseph and his family were on their way to a new country, a new life. But all Joseph could think about was what terrible things must have happened to his father to make him look so awful and act so scared.
All right, so before we start, Isabel, if you need a reminder of what's going on, please turn to page 29. Check in on that. Isabel, just outside Havana, Cuba, 1994. Isabel and her grandfather set her poppy in a chair in their little kitchen, and Isabel's mother, Teresa Padron de Fernandez, ran to the cabinet under the sink. Isabel hurried after her. Mommy was very pregnant. She was due in a week's time, so Isabel knelt down to find the iodine. Isabel's father, Geraldo Fernandez, had always been a handsome man, but he didn't look it now. There was blood in his hair, and the area around one of his eyes was already turning black. When they pulled his white linen shirt off him, his back was covered with welts. Isabel watched as Mommy cleaned his cuts with a washcloth. Poppy hissed as she disinfected them with the iodine. What happened? Isabel's mother asked. An industrialist baseball game played on the television in the corner, and Isabel's father, grandfather turned down the volume. There was a riot on the Malacón, Lito said. They ran out of food too fast. I can't stay here, Poppy said. His head was bent low, but his voice was loud and clear. Not any longer. They'll come for me. So let's take a look at that phrasing. Can you make a connection to another character's story? Everyone was quiet at that. The only sound was the soft crack of a bat and the roar of the crowd on the television. Poppy had already tried to flee Cuba twice. The first time, he and three other men had built a raft and tried to paddle their way to Florida. But a tropical storm turned them back. The second time, his boat had a motor, but he'd been caught by the Cuban Navy and had ended up in jail. Now it was even harder to escape. For decades, the United States had rescued any Cuban refugees they found at sea and taken them to Florida. But the food shortages had driven more and more Cubans to El Norte. Too many. The Americans had a new policy everyone called wet foot, dry foot. If Cuban refugees were caught at sea with wet feet, they were sent to the U.S. naval base at Guantanamo Bay at the southern end of Cuba. From there, they could choose to return to Cuba and Castro or languish in a refugee camp while the United States decided what to do with them. But if they managed to survive the trip across the Straits of Florida and evade the U.S. Coast Guard and actually set foot on United States soil, be caught with dry feet, they were granted special refugee status and allowed to remain and become U.S. citizens. So there's a lot of history in here. So if you need to go back and read through that, go for it. Poppy was going to run away again, and this time, whether he got caught with wet feet or dry feet, he wasn't coming back. There's no reason to go throwing yourself onto a raft in the ocean, Lito said. You can just lie low for a while. I know a little shack in the cane fields. Things will get better. You'll see. Poppy slammed a fist on the table. And how exactly are they going to get better, Mariano? Do you think the Soviet Union is going to suddenly decide to get back together and start sending us food again? No one is coming to help us. And Castro's only making things worse. As if saying his name made him appear, the baseball game on television was interrupted by a special message from the Cuban president. Fidel Castro was an old man with liver spots on his forehead, gray hair, a big bushy gray beard, and bags under his eyes. He wore the same thing he did every time he was on television, a green military jacket and flat round cap, and sat behind a row of microphones. Everyone got quiet as Lito turned up the volume. Castro condemned the violence that had been broken out on the Malacón, blaming it on U.S. agents. Poppy scoffed. It wasn't U.S. agents. It was hungry Cubans. Castro rambled on without a script, quoting novels and telling personal anecdotes about the revolution. Oh, turn it off, Poppy said. But before Mommy had reached the set, Castro said something that made them all sit up and listen. We cannot continue guarding the borders of the United States while they send their CIA to instigate riots in Havana. This is that is when incidents like this occur. 
and the world calls the Cuban government cruel and inhumane. And so, until there is a speedy and efficient solution, we are suspending all obstacles so that those who wish to leave Cuba may do so legally, once and for all. We will not stand in their way. What did he just say? Mommy asked. Poppy's eyes were wide as he stood from the kitchen table. Castro just said, anybody who wants to can leave. Isabel felt as though her heart had been ripped out of her chest. If Castro was letting anyone leave, her father would be gone before the sun rose the next day. She could see it in his wild look. Thinking about what Isabel's figuring out here. Anyone's allowed to leave Cuba if they want to. It looks like her dad's going to make that decision. How does she feel and why? You can't go now, Lito told Poppy. You have a family to take care of, a wife, a daughter, a son on the way. Isabel's father and grandfather yelled at each other about dictators and freedom and families and responsibility. Lito was her mother's father, and he and Poppy had never gotten along. Isabel covered her ears and stepped away. She had to think of some answer to all of this, some solution that would help keep her family together. And she had it. We'll all go, Isabel cried. That shut everybody up. Even Castro stopped talking, and the TV went back to showing the baseball game. No, Poppy and Lito said at the same time. Why not, Isabel said. Your mother is pregnant, for one thing, Lito said. There's no food to feed the baby here anyway, Isabel said. There's no food for any of us and no money to buy it with if there was. But there is food in the States and freedom and work. And a place where her father wouldn't be beaten or arrested or run away. We'll all go while Castro is letting people out, she went on. Lito, too. What? But I... No. Lito protested. They were all quiet a moment more until her father said, but I don't even have a boat. Isabel nodded. She could fix that too. Without saying anything, Isabel ran next door to the Castillo's home. Luis, the older boy who'd saved her from the policeman's nightstick, wasn't home from work yet, and neither was his mother, Juanita, who worked at the cooperative law office. But Isabel found Ivan and his father, Rudy, right where she thought they'd be, working on their boat in the shed. It was an ugly blue thing, cobbled together out of old metal advertisements and road signs and oil drums. It barely qualified as a boat, but it was big enough for the four Castillos and maybe four more guests. Well, if it isn't Hurricane Isabel, Senor Castillo said. He had white hair that he wore swept back on his head. And even though there was no food, he had a middle-aged paunch to his belly. You have to take us with you, Isabel said. No, we don't, Senor Castillo said. Ivan, nail. People are rioting in Havana, Isabel said. Tell me something I don't know, Senor Castillo said. Ivan, nail. Ivan handed him another nail. My father was almost arrested, Isabel said. If you don't take us with you, they'll throw him in prison. Senor Castillo paused his hammering for a moment, then shook his head. There's no room, and we don't need a fugitive on board. Fugitives being someone who's running away from the law. Ivan looked at him funny, but only Isabel saw it. Please, Isabel begged. We don't have any gasoline anyway, Ivan said. He put a hand to the motorcycle motor they'd mount mounted inside the boat. We're not going anywhere soon. I can fix that, Isabel said. She ran home again. Her father and grandfather were still arguing in the kitchen, so she slipped in the back way. She grabbed her trumpet, gave it one long, sad look, and ran out the back door. She was already in the street when she stopped, ran to her backyard, and snatched up the little mewling kitten, too. With, her, with the trumpet in one arm and the kitten in the other, she ran the few blocks to the beach, where she banged on the door of a fisherman her grandfather knew. His gas-powered fishing boat rocked gently at a little pier nearby. The fisherman came to his door, licking his fingers and frowning. Isabel had caught him at dinner. Fried fish, it smelled like. The kitten's nose sniffed eagerly at the air, and it meowed. Isabel's stomach growled. 
You're Mariano Padron's granddaughter, aren't you? The fisherman said. What do you want? I need gasoline, Isabel told him. Is that so? Well, I need money. I don't have any money, Isabel said, but I have this. She held out the trumpet. Isabel regretted that its brass was a little tarnished, but it was the most valuable thing she owned. The fisherman had to take it in trade. What am I going to do with that? He asked. Sell it, Isabel told him. It's French and old and plays like a dream. The fisherman sighed. And why do you need gasoline so badly? To leave Cuba before my father is arrested. The fisherman wiped his lips on the back of his hand. Isabel stood for what seemed like hours, her insides churning like a water spout. At last, he reached out and took the trumpet. Wait here, he told her. Isabel held her breath and soon the fisherman came back with two enormous plastic jugs of gasoline. Each one came up to Isabel's chest. Is it enough? Isabel asked. To get you to Miami? Yes. And back again. Isabel's heart soared and she hopped up and down. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Isabel told him, oh, and you have to take the kitten too. She held the wiggling creature out to him. but The old fisherman just stared at it. Is that so? The fisherman said. Please, Isabel said, or else someone will catch her and eat her. But you have to, but you have fish to eat. She can eat the scraps. The fisherman eyed the cat suspiciously. Is it a good mouser? Yes, Isabel said, though she was sure that even a mouse would give the scrawny thing trouble. Her name is Leona. The old fisherman sighed and took the squirming kitten from her. Isabel smiled, then noticed how big and heavy the gas cans were. Oh, Anne, I also need you to help me carry these back. Thinking about this whole scene with Isabel, what adjective could you use to describe her and why? Another reminder, if you need to know what's going on with Mahmoud, you can go back to page 33 to check that out. Mahmoud, Aleppo, Syria, 2015. Through the huge hole that used to be the wall of his apartment, Mahmoud saw gray-white clouds from missile strikes blooming all around. He shook his head, trying to clear the ringing and spied his little brother. Walid was sitting right where he had been before the attack, on the floor in front of the TV. Only the TV wasn't there anymore. It had fallen five stories to the ground below, along with the outside wall and Walid was centimeters from joining them both. Walid, don't move, Mahmoud cried. He hurried across the room, his ankles turning painfully on broken bits of wall. Walid sat, sat still as a statue, and he looked like one too. He was covered with a fine gray powder from head to foot, like he'd taken a bath in dry concrete mix. Mahmoud finally reached him, snatching him up and away from the cliff's edge that used to be their wall. Walid, Walid, are you okay? Mahmoud asked, turning him around. Walid's eyes were alive, but empty. Walid, talk to me. Are you all right? Walid finally looked up at him. You're bleeding, was all he said. Mahmoud, Walid, their mother cried. She staggered to the door of her bedroom, Hana crying in her arms. Oh, thank God you're alive, their mom said. She dropped to her knees and pulled them both into a hug. Mahmoud's heart was racing, his ears still buzzed, and his shoulder burned. But they were alive. They were all alive. He felt tears come to his eyes and wiped them away. The floor beneath their feet groaned and shifted. We have to get out of here, Mahmoud's mother said, putting Hana in Mahmoud's arms. Go, go. Take your brother and your sister. I'll be right behind you. I just have to grab a few things. Mom, no. Go, she told Mahmoud, pushing them all toward the door. Mahmoud clutched Hana with one arm and took his brother's hand. He dragged Walid with him toward the front door, but Walid pulled back. What about my action figures? Walid asked. He looked over his shoulder like he wanted to go back for them. We'll buy new ones, Mahmoud told him. We have to get out of here.
Across the hall, the Sarah family filled the corridor, mother, father, and twin daughters, both younger than Waleed. What's happened? Mr. Sarah asked Mahmoud, and then he saw the missing wall and his eyes went wide. The building's been hit, Mahmoud said. We have to get out. Mr. and Mrs. Sarah hurried back into their apartment, and Mahmoud carried Hana down the stairs, pulling Waleed behind them. Halfway to the ground, the building shifted again, and the concrete stairs broke away from the wall, leaving a five-centimeter crack. Mahmoud grabbed the railing to steady himself and waited a long, breathless moment to see if the stairs were going to collapse. When they didn't, he ran the rest of the way down and burst out onto the street, Hana still in his arms and his brother right behind him. Rubble was strewn everywhere. Missiles and bombs thudded nearby, close enough to shake loose parts of wall. A building shuddered and collapsed, smoke and debris avalanching out into the street. Mahmoud jumped when it fell, but Waleed stood still. Like this kind of thing happened every day. So we've seen a couple of descriptions of Waleed like this, where he doesn't really show any emotion. And right here, he's just kind of standing still. Why do you think Alan Gratz writes Waleed this way? With a jolt of surprise, Mahmoud realized this kind of thing did happen every day, just not to them, until now. Everywhere around them, people fled into the streets, covered in gray dust and blood. No sirens rang. No ambulances came to help the wounded. No police cars or emergency crews hurried to the scene. There weren't any left. Mahmoud stared up at their building. The whole front had collapsed and Mahmoud felt like he was looking into a giant dollhouse. Each floor had a living room and a kitchen just like theirs, all decorated differently. The building groaned again and a kitchen on the top floor began to tip toward the street. It collapsed onto the sixth floor and then into Mahmoud's apartment and on down like dominoes. Mahmoud barely had time to yell, run, and drag Waleed and his sister away before the whole building came crashing down into the street, thundering like a fighter jet, like a jet fighter. Safe on the sidewalk across the street, clutching Hana and Waleed, Mahmoud suddenly realized his mother had still been in the building. Mom, mom, Mahmoud yelled. Mahmoud, Walid, he heard his mother cry, and she came out from the from behind the pile of rubble with the Sarah family, all of them covered in gray dust. She ran toward Mahmoud and embraced him, Walid and Hana. We went out the back stairs, she told them, and just in time. Mahmoud looked up at where his apartment had been. It wasn't there anymore. His home was totally destroyed. What would they do now? Where would they go? Put yourself in this situation. How would you feel here and why? Mahmoud's mother was carrying their school backpacks and she traded them for Hana. Mahmoud couldn't understand why his mother had bothered to save their backpacks until he saw that they were stuffed with clothes and diapers. She had gone back for whatever she could take from the apartment. Everything they owned was in these two backpacks. I can't reach your father, Mahmoud's mother said, thumbing her phone. There's no service again. Mahmoud's father was an engineer with a mobile phone company. If the phones were out, he was probably working on trying to fix them. But what if his father had been hit by one of the bombs? Mahmoud's stomach twisted into knots just thinking about it. But then there his dad was, running down the street toward them, and Mahmoud felt like he could fly. Fatima, Mahmoud, Walid, Hana, his father cried. He wrapped them all in a hug and kissed little Hana on the forehead. Thank God you're all alive, he cried. Dad, our house is gone, Mahmoud told him. What do we do? What we should have done a long time ago. We're leaving Aleppo now. I parked the car nearby. We can be in Turkey by tomorrow. We can sell the car there and make our way north to Germany. Everyone stopped while Mahmoud's father walked ahead. Germany? Mahmoud's mother said. Mahmoud felt as stunned as his mother sounded. Germany? He remembered the map of the world that hung in his classroom. Germany was somewhere up north in the heart of Europe. He couldn't imagine traveling that far. Just for a little while, Mahmoud's father said. 
I saw on the TV they're accepting refugees. We can stay there until all this is over, until we can come back home. It's cold in Germany, Mahmoud said. Do you want to build a snowman? His father sang. They had seen Frozen in a movie theater, back when they could get to the now government-controlled side of the city that had theaters. Yusuf, mother, Mahmoud's mom warned. Mahmoud's dad looked sheepish. It doesn't have to be a snowman. This is serious, Mom said. I know we've been talking about leaving, but now, like this, we were going to pack, plan, buy tickets, book hotel rooms. All we have now are two backpacks and our phones. Germany is a long way away. How will we get there? By car first, Mahmoud's father shrugged. Then by boat, by train, by bus, on foot? I don't know. What choice do we have? Our home is destroyed. Are you able to get the cash we've put away? Mahmoud's mother nodded, but she was clearly still worried. So we have money. We will buy tickets as we go. More importantly, we have our lives. But if we stay in Aleppo a day longer, we may not even have that. Mahmoud's father looked from his wife to Hana to Mahmoud to Walid. We've spent too much time talking about it and not doing anything. It's not safe here. It hasn't been for months, years. We should have gone long ago. Ready or not, if we want to live, we have to leave Syria. So I want you to just make sure that you know exactly what's going on with all three of these stories. I want you to answer this question, and you can, if you want to write at the bottom of your own book, right on this page, which is 55, that's totally fine. If you want to clarify it on the bottom of each chapter, then go ahead and do that. But I need you to answer, where is Joseph trying to go? Where is Isabel trying to go? And where is Mahmoud trying to go?